kid. Welcome, welcome everybody back to another episode of the Handsome Home Buyer Podcast. I'm your host, Charles, aka the Handsome Home Buyer, aka Captain Permit, aka El Julio Maravilloso. For those of you who don't know, that means the marvelous Jew. Uh, you know who else is marvelous? Captain Permit. 516 513 883. And if you need plans, if you need permits, if you need anything building related, we got you. 516 516- 513-8838. If you have a house that smells like cat pee, is dated from the 1960s, has six inches of mold on the wall, human waste floating past the basement step steps, a fridge that was shut off with rotting meat, which I'm going to go look at right after this, commercial land for development notes, you name it, I'm easy, I want to buy it. 516-777, sold. Um, as you guys can hear, I'm pumped up, Pump, more pumped up than usual. We're on fire. A lot of great things happening. Obviously, everyone knows, everyone's seen the YouTube video. Oceanside redevelopment, the best, and I mean Long Island is the best, only getting better. Working with the Oceanside Jewish Center, they have roughly four acres. We're going to be subdividing and taking approximately 2.5 of those acres. We are doing it in a way that nobody, and I mean nobody, does it, in my opinion, which is we came up with five very unique, economically viable options for the people in the community that there's a tremendous need for, and we are going to them, to the community. We had an amazing meeting with the Kiwanis Club on Monday. We're going to be on Wednesday, excuse me, that went very well. We have a meeting with the Chamber of Commerce on Monday, and then we have an open forum at the temple where everybody in Oceanside who has interest is invited to come. And essentially what we're gonna do is we're gonna discuss the five concepts, the positives, the negatives, obviously I have my favorites, but in the interest of a completely open forum where the people in the neighborhood have input in what goes in their backyard and what it looks like, we are gonna allow them to make the decision and give their feedback. So I'm very excited about that. Uh, eight unit apartment building out in Patchog in full swing, uh, 7,200 square feet of medical development in North Massapequa, and the deals just keep on coming high five yeah. boom boom all right so we have two amazing guests today i thought we were only gonna have one amazing guest but now we have two for the price of one who's better than us so uh, as you guys know i go to nyu i'm finishing up there i met a gentleman there his name is john awesome guy and john has um experience in affordable housing i don't know a lot about affordable housing so he tells me about his company we start talking i go in I meet the owners, everybody there. Unbelievable place. Our guests today are local. At least one of them is Long Island born. One of them is Queens, which is basically the same thing. Yeah, we'll, uh, Stony Brook too, so. we'll adopt you. MDG Development, affordable housing developer. They have been in existence since 1988. They have developed and constructed over 19,000 units, primarily in New York. Now they're expanding to Florida and New Jersey to do property management unbelievable group of people it felt like family from the moment i walked in the door allow me to introduce mike rooney jr and jonathan cruz thank you for having us yeah thanks for having us you like the way i said cruz of course you got it down pat right? like you're the kind of guy that when you walk into a room and someone says jonathan cruz like trumpets play in the background or like salsa or something <laughs> like there's just like a smoothness yeah and i think i can that. tell you've been practicing it because you got the cruz? It. Yeah, it's very very smooth some people know you guys don't because we don't know each other that that well but i was spanish in a previous life so like i i, I feel like i am a, a a spanish man in a jewish man's body yeah i actually feel the same way my wife is puerto rican as a matter oh of yeah yeah 100 uh 75 percent puerto rican 25 percent cuban wow so i'm like I'm, a, I'm an adopted uh puerto rican no kidding so yeah Dude, you are going to have, and you have um, three boys. Three boys, correct. Your kids are going to be like runway models. Yeah, no, they're, they're all like, right. Yeah, very good looking boys. The yeah. combination, and you have good hair, yeah, right? Yeah. Which Absolutely. I always like to comment on because obviously I don't I don't have any <laughs> hair. But yeah, man, I, uh, I actually feel, I fear for the female gender when they get to the age of 16 plus yeah. because it's, it's, it's gonna be tough. Yes, yeah, now they're already ladies, man. They st actually they started Spanish school yesterday. Wow. Yes. So they're or two of them, the twins are. So, uh -huh. so they're learning Spanish um, in a school, and my wife speaks Spanish to them. Fluently. School. Fluently, yeah. Wow. Yeah. So we're we're trying to make sure that they learn it as well before the, you know the English kicks in. Very cool. Very 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 cool. Um, so I have loads of questions. Obviously, you guys are are very young. 
unbelievably impressive what you've done, what you're doing. Um, I guess I want to get a little bit of background. Obviously, you're local Long Island. You're you're from Queens. You're local from Long Island. Yep. Just a little background about like um, where you grew up, college, etc. Yeah. So I grew up in well, I, I grew up in Dix Hills, Long Island, and then uh, I guess around the time of second or third grade, moved out to Nisiquag, which is a small town on the North Shore, over by like the St. James Smithtown area. Mm-hmm. Um, went to school at Pace University in New York City, downtown Manhattan. Studied finance there, um, but all throughout that time, uh, kind of been working in the family company, yeah. which has been you know the construction and development business. Did um did you know at a very early age? Because I I didn't figure out what I wanted to do until I was really like in my early thirties. Mm-hmm. Did you know from a very young age that this is what you love to do and you were gonna? No, I mean, actually, so at a young age, I wanted to, you know, I wanted to play Major League Baseball. That was the dream. That's right. I yeah. heard that you, uh, you're you quite the ball player. Yeah, well, back in the day. And uh, I gave it up uh, probably, I guess, 11th grade in high school. Mm-hmm. Um, it, just, it just wasn't for me, even though I love playing it and stuff like that. Um, and I didn't really know I wanted to be in construction or development until, I don't know, I guess until after college, until I was like, okay what do I do now? And yeah. then I was like, well, you know, maybe I'll give this a shot. So I started out doing the construction. I was a laborer. Okay. And then I started doing a little carpentry. Wow. And then I did, you know, I became a supervisor, you know, within my dad's company. Uh, but I got to learn from the bottom up, basically. So, but to give you so, and my, my, my opinion of you is that you're a very humble guy. Okay. And a lot of people that come into their businesses, into businesses that were family-owned businesses, they, they aren't humble people. And I think what you just explained about how you came up in the business mm-hmm. and how you were kind of forced from, you know, to, to start at the bottom. A, it's great because you get to learn and identify with everybody in your company, which I think is the most important yeah. thing, right? You know, you can't come in at the top, big corner office, whatever it is, and then be dictating the people who you haven't, you know, sweat next to or struggled with or yeah. can identify what they struggle with because you haven't been there. Yeah, absolutely. No, I mean... It's something I think, you know, probably my dad kind of instilled in me. Uh, you know, even when I was young, he'd bring me into the office at 5 a.m. Mm-hmm. So he was like, an, he's a really early, early starter. I mean, even earlier than that sometimes. Now he's more like 6 a.m. But, you know, uh, when I was younger, 5 a.m. So, I, you know, I'd be there with him working hard and stuff like that. And he always taught me, you know, if you are the owner of a business, it means you work harder than everybody. Yeah. It doesn't mean you work less than everybody. Yeah, the um, so I'm half Sicilian. I'm I'm Jewish. My mother's 100 percent Sicilian. My dad's half Polish, half Russian, right? So the Sicilians have a saying that the fish stinks from the head down. Mm. So obviously, like us as leaders, as business owners, it's if there's a problem in our company, it's we we are to blame for it. Yeah. Right. Regardless, doesn't matter how far removed we are, how big the company gets, it's right. ultimately yep. your. So you, am I not remembering this right? But do you Columbia grad school? No, no. So, well, I think maybe you're thinking of my brother. So I have a brother that's in the business as okay. well. Oh, I didn't know that. Uh, but no, he, no grad school, but he graduated from NYU. Okay. And I don't know, maybe there, there was a connection there, but his wife uh, went to Columbia. Okay. So you, you went to college, you got out, you were kind of like, as we all are, a little bit lost. Where am I going? What's the rest of my life? Because listen, at 21 years old, you're supposed to know like what you want to do with the rest mm. of your life. Go into the family business and then got the bug. Uh, got the bug because you know like so as you mentioned we do a lot of affordable housing Mm -hmm. so I think working on the job sites and we do a lot of so we'll acquire a building and then we'll rehab it okay we'll rehab it with the families living in the building at the same time so we're doing kitchen renovations bathroom renovations everything yeah and while you're in there you get to you get to know the families you get to you know know everything about them basically and by the end of the job they're cooking for you and stuff like that which is really cool but I think that part of it, you know, the the people part of it, really yeah. seeing how we're impacting people's lives, yeah. that's kind of really what got me excited about affordable housing and wanting to join the business and take it, you know, in a, uh, another step further. Yeah, and this is what, when I was having the meeting with Kiwanis and when I discuss with people development, like developers, you know, kind of have a, a negative connotation to it. Mm-hmm. And you know, in, in a certain way, because of the way history has been and the way developers have worked, not all of them, but a lot of them, it, it's somewhat deserved, right? But that yeah. doesn't mean that you can't develop and you can't do great things like what you're doing or what we're going to be doing uh, in a socially responsible way that, yeah. that benefits a lot of people yeah. and allows people to have uh, inputs. I'm curious to know a little bit about, I mean, MDG has a, 
has an extensive history. I mean, 1988, mm -hmm. although it feels like it was 86 and the Mets were just winning the World Series, it's a really long time ago. Yeah. Um, I'm just curious to know, briefly high level, like, you know, how your father got started and how it started to steamroll because New York City in the 80s yeah. was a very different place than it very, is right very now. Different place, yeah. My dad, so he actually, so this is a crazy story, but he bought his first building when he was 18 years old uh, for no money down. He bought a building in the Bronx. Uh, so that's kind of how we got kicked off. Wow. Yeah. So, um, you know, through, you know, different financing tricks and stuff like that. So he was able to acquire some properties really young and stuff like that. I so, didn't even know what to do at 18. Uh, well, I mean, the city was definitely different back then. You know what yeah. I mean? Like you mentioned, it was completely different than it is now. It was, yeah. You know, the burning down buildings. And, yeah, they were like giving buildings giving away buildings essentially away. for like a dollar. Exactly, exactly. Literally. Exactly. So so I think he kind of took advantage of that. Um, but anyways, he actually ended up joining his family company, which was in the oil business. Um, and he studied accounting, by the way, in, uh, in college. Okay. Um, so... Uh, so he did a few things. So he was an accountant. He, he he had real estate clients. So he learned the real estate business through them. Okay. Um, and then he also joined his family company. So he had kind of a steady job for a little while. And then he realized that you know, hey, I can make money doing real estate full time. And he partnered with a friend of his who knows construction really well. And they just decided to start acquiring buildings, rehabbing them, and using uh, city city money to do it actually. Interesting. Yeah. So he went from day one. He kind of just almost stumbled into affordable housing, just being. Yes. It was kind of the seizing the opportunity of right. this is New York City at this time. Yeah. You know what's available. What can we do here? Yeah, the city. You know, distressed neighborhoods, and I guess it was. Well, I'm not sure who the mayor was at the time, but the city had all these different programs yeah. uh, to basically finance the acquisition of buildings and rehab yeah. them and turn them around because, because lot, yeah. blocks of Harlem were were va basically vacant. Yeah. So there's a lot of opportunity. It was like Detroit in like 2009. Yeah. Right. I heard. Yeah, yeah. And nobody wanted to touch it. Yeah. So you had to be really, really crazy to even get involved with the business. Um, wow. So was your dad like, was that kind of like the, um, like, the pinnacle of just the bottom of New York City was your dad really one of the first people to really yeah get in and, and run with it yeah he's done probably two or three hundred buildings in central Harlem wow yeah, so he's kind of like the original Harlem he, developer he is the OG he's the OG one of the OGs at least yeah so uh, so we actually we still own uh, probably about a hundred properties in Harlem today wow and today Harlem is a very very different place yep. that continues up yeah. and up and up. Yeah, people think it's gentrifying now, but actually, you know, and gentr uh, gentrification is kind of a negative uh, word. But it was it was definitely there was a turning point back then, and it's still turning today. So basically, but when we developed those buildings, we did them as affordable housing. So the idea was to keep people in the neighborhood and stuff like that. Now yeah. in Harlem, it's a little bit different where. People are actually kind of getting priced out of neighborhoods. Yeah. People are getting bought out and kicked out and stuff like that. Yeah, no, I see brownstones selling for multiple millions. I mean, you walk down mm -hmm. the street, it's it's happening. There's restaurants, there's bars. Yeah. Like the energy is great. It's um, it's a very cool place. It's just, it's tough because, I mean, again, who people are buying two, three, four, five, ten million dollar condos, brownstones, etc. Yeah. Like. Yeah. You know who are these people where is this money coming from this isn't the overwhelming majority yeah. which is where you know affordable quote-unquote affordable housing comes in and um, one of the real reasons I, I want to bring you on is because I want you to kind of explain and go over affordable housing and there's a lot of different options and I think people's impression of affordable housing and what it actually is are very very different I'll yeah. give a um, an example that I've given people many times I was looking at a I think it was like 10 or 15 acres, something in, in Riverhead. Mm -hmm. And it's one property per acre. You could build 10 houses. And if you go affordable, you can do twice the density. Right. So I was looking into it, and um, I was having a conversation with local people, and they were like, we don't want the affordable, we want the affordable. I'm like, listen, do you know that an affordable house in Riverhead is $400,000? Yeah. Like, in my opinion, rates just dropped. Um, people think I'm a little nuts. I think we're in a recession just my opinion mm -hmm. right two years ago in February I kind of had this funny feeling yeah. and I, I I made a prediction to friends of mine I was looking Q4 of 2019 I was like 
I think things aren't going to be that great. I think we're there now. I think rates dropping is a sign of that, in my personal opinion. Yeah. I think people will start to realize it a year from now because nothing goes like yeah. that fast. Yeah. All of a sudden, people realize, like, oh, what's going on? Right. But in the housing market, single-family housing market, for example, in Nassau, anything over 550 is really sitting. Anything in Suffolk over 400 is really sitting. Yep. And uh, any a lot of the stuff in Manhattan on the luxury side, anything luxury isn't selling. Or it's I mean workforce housing in um, in Manhattan is like one to three million. Yeah, it, which is it's just it's mind boggling, right? Yeah, is is really sitting like the brokers are really having a hard time. Yep. There's condo developments that are totally empty and not sold out. I was speaking to um, a buddy of mine, Joe Piccinini, was on the podcast a few weeks ago. He's a luxury Hamptons guy. Mm -hmm. He's saying the Hamptons market is not moving the way it was either yeah so it, it typically it starts from the top and then kind of right. compresses yeah with that said i mean the country in general has a massive affordable housing problem mm -hmm. long island has a a housing problem and b an affordability problem yeah. period yeah the end across the board and now you see people when presented in in the right way and educating people are becoming a lot more open to affordable housing because yeah. it's not what people stereotypically think of. Yeah, no, exactly. I mean, I was reading an article, I think it was in Newsday yesterday or two days ago. Yeah, I saw that. Yeah, that uh, millennials basically, or, you know, or just people in Long Island are in leaving. general, they're leaving. They're dropping like flies. People going to Florida, the Carolinas. We have somebody in our office that's moving out to the Carolinas right now. Actually, yeah. and people are retiring there. People going to Texas. Arizona, Texas. Yeah. Uh, these are all like Long Island populations in different states. Yeah. So it's uh, it, and everybody will tell you it's for the same reason because the cost to live on Long Island is just way, way too high. Um, and you know, you're talking about you know what the average medium incomes are, and you know, like in New York City, it's you know I think it's probably what 120,000. Uh, yeah. Even, the average income? Yeah, yeah. Even out yeah. here on Long Island, same kind of thing. Yeah, yeah. 90, 100, 120, 125,000 yeah. dollars, depending make sense. on where you are. Because when you look around and you know, you know, you know, you have friends and family and stuff like that. That does, that's really not that. that that's pretty tough to get to. One hundred and twenty thousand dollars a year, a salary yeah. of that. Mm -hmm. It's it's unheard of. So people people got to move out. It's it's a lot of money, and the crazy thing is, like, even if you make that kind of money. Yeah. It is still very hard to live here. Like, if you yeah. make $125,000 a year, you're not in a Ferrari lighting the world on fire. No, like, no, exactly. You're not. Like, after you get taxed, and then, obviously, the new tax laws have not helped at all, right. especially on Long Island. Right. Well, you have property taxes. Exactly. Yeah, you can't deduct them anymore. Right? You can only deduct $10,000 right. worth of state. So now you have people, you know, 10, 12, 15, 20, 30,000 dollars, etc. Yeah. The mansion tax, I mean, obviously, we're talking about a different group of people, but... That hurts the economy too. You know about the, the they changed the mansion tax. Wait, it's, it was a million before. What is it up to? But now? they they like they stagger the percentages. So like, you know, I know people that are out there like I'm not going to cry for for a millionaire, but it, mm -hmm. it does affect it does affect the sales of these properties, which affects the overall economy. Yeah. Mm -hmm. After a million, they um, there's an additional tax. You pay the transfer tax for a new development, and then there's additional I think one to five percent fee on top of that. Yeah. So like it just gets to the point where. It's crazy. And what I think a lot of people don't realize is over 50% of the country's GDP is controlled by real estate in mm -hmm. one way, shape, or form, yeah. where it's property management, construction, Home Depot, supply houses, you know, whatever it is. So when things go bad, it really affects the economy. Yeah. Well, I, you know, just uh, in, in New York City, for example, the reason why I see that the real estate market is just going down and down and down is because... I think we had a lot of overseas buyers yeah. for a long time buying at, buying at condos. And they were just ghost buyers and they were just holding the properties. But I think it artificially inflated all the prices across the board in New York City. Mm -hmm. And developers kept building and building and building for the luxury market. And now there's just so much inventory. N nobody, there's, there's no buyers out there. Yeah. It's not, you know... It's 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 unaffordable and there's no real uh, target population to occupy those units. No, hundred percent. So educate the uh, the listener base about affordable housing in general. Yeah. So let's talk about. So essentially, there's a lot of different programs mm -hmm. in different areas from seniors, not senior, um, you know, sizes of buildings, and then I want everyone to understand what 
AMI is or average median income mm -hmm. and then the percentages and, and how that works. Yeah. So, so to be considered, so there's no reason to beat around the bush because I think a lot of people say, you know, call it workforce housing. You know what I mean? It's, it's a, workforce housing is affordable housing is low income housing. Mm -hmm. And once you say low income, that's when everybody starts to worry. Uh, so low income housing is considered 60% of AMI. And uh, I looked it up uh, before, don't quote me on this, but I believe 60% of AMI in Nassau County is about $50,000 a year for an individual. Mm. And that's that doesn't seem that low to me. And I mean, I think that's, no. you know, I, especially if you're coming out of college, you're a young professional, you're not making over $50,000 right off the bat. No. Um, so, you know, that that's one population that I see that is you know, getting displaced to the Carolinas, Florida, like we talked about, um, that's a very vulnerable, vulnerable population in Long Island that needs this kind of housing. Yeah. The second most vulnerable population is seniors. Seniors, uh, you know, they're living off their pensions, they're yeah. living off Social Security, um, and with Long Island's prices, you know, you, you hear people all the time in Long Island, once they retire, they go to Florida, they go to the Carolinas. Yeah. So how do you keep these people on Long Island? And the answer is, it, answer is affordable housing. And there's specific senior uh, subsidies and programs to build affordable housing for seniors. Yeah, no, with, uh, without a doubt. I mean, there's, the, there's, there's certain stats that people may or may not be aware of. One is, the obviously everybody knows that we have a growing senior population, baby mm -hmm. boomers, et cetera. Yep. But by 2060, which isn't that far away, literally 25% of the country is going to be 65 and over. By 2030, yeah. it's gonna be in the 20s, and for the first time in history, in 2030, the amount of people that are 65 and over, the percentage is going to be greater than the people that are 18 years old or younger, Correct. which has never happened before. You know, as far as Long Island, like, Long Island's an amazing place, we all grew up here, we all love it, we all mm -hmm. wanna stay here, yep. but there are, some, there are some concerns. You have the younger people mm -hmm. who can't afford to live here, yep. And uh, I mean, these are our friends, yeah. our brothers, our sisters, our cousins, et cetera. They're people just like us that grew up in the same places, Huntington, yeah. Oceanside, Wanto, whatever it is, and they wanna stay here and make a life for themselves. Uh, another thing is just, you know, trends. Long Island was the first suburb, mm -hmm. right, of the country, real like yeah. suburb, suburb. Yeah, that's right. And there's kind of like a little bit of a shift where the younger population prefers something a little bit more transit oriented. Mm -hmm. They wanna be able to like kind of live, work, play. Yeah. And you get a lot of people that talk and talk and talk about how you want to help Long Island and this and that, but how do we create more jobs that are higher paying? How do we create housing that is affordable for people to yeah. raise families? I mean, any... Well, yeah, no, I mean, actually, I think Long Island has a very, very unique opportunity to actually house a lot of these millennials that are taking jobs in the city but can't afford to live in the city. Yeah. Because the city's just way too expensive. It's just it's, astronomical. It's, crazy. it's impossible. So rather than these kids moving down out of state, they might as well stay on Long Island. They can keep their, their great job that they've been working so hard to in the city. And if they, they you know, we can build in transient oriented areas where there's train stations nearby and things yeah. like that. So that's one of the things we've kind of been targeting. We're trying to develop more on Long Island. We've done a project in Amityville and we're trying to um, get some approvals on uh, doing a project uh, actually at our office in Huntington Station. Nice. And we're literally a block away from the station and it's an hour away from the city by train. I mean, it doesn't get any better than that if you're yeah. a young professional. Without a doubt. And, but the only way to actually make it work is to offer affordable housing where, you know, the income that you need to meet is say 50 to 60,000, you know, and it goes up as you have a family and stuff like that. Um, so the more people, the higher income, you can qualify for that housing. No, absolutely. And anybody that has been to Huntington any time in the recent future knows that it is an unbelievable area that everybody yeah. wants to be in. I mean, it's just growing, growing the whole Main Street strip. You have the Paramount. I mean, you have tons of stores, bars, yeah. young people, yeah. you know, just a great mix of, of cultures and age groups. Yeah. It's, it's a magical place to go and, and hang out and spend time. And here's another interesting point, because uh, students are taking on tons of student debt, right? Yeah, so, I mean, huge problem. So people coming out of college and they owe all this money, they're not ready to buy a house. And on Long Island, the main uh, housing out here is to buy. 
Yeah. So it's just it's just not feasible for for the young people. Uh, so you might as well offer that rental option and offer it at uh, an affordable rate. No, with with that about, and you know what I I think there is a happy medium that everybody can kind of work out, which is you have a certain you know we're not talking about building thirty foot skyscrapers here. We're not. It just it doesn't fit. But you can develop a little bit of a transit oriented, like you said, apartment s type of. Yeah. Um, lifestyle and still set back have the single family homes and have kind of this diverse yeah. housing mix mm-hmm. that is that's rare that's uniquely long island because they don't have that everywhere yeah and and another stigma about affordable housing is that it looks like concrete walls and the place is no. run down with graffiti all over the place that's 100 percent false all of our developments and people in our industry that actually are affordable housing develop, uh, developers that do it year in, year out, yeah. our standard of finishes is higher than market rate finishes. Yeah. And, you know, especially, I mean, I think the state and the cities impose that on us. Well, and also because we want a nice place to live. But uh, it, it's, you know, we're talking granite countertops. We're talking yeah. stainless steel appliances, yeah. hardwood floors. It looks nice, and these are this is brand new construction because that's yeah. what the state and city are funding. They're funding us to to rehab these buildings or to build these buildings. And if we're putting taxpayer money into the into into this housing, it's got to look nice. Yeah. So I think also when um, let's talk about the financing on like a very high level, so people mm-hmm. understand. And there's always locally, there's always controversy about tax breaks and specifically pilot programs mm. right so obviously in, in certain cases you you know you need a little bit of a, of a tax break to get the economics of it to work because obviously affordable housing if, if if you put side by side if you have a brand new complex let's call let, let's not talk about senior for a second let's talk about just market rate or you know let's talk about senior yeah. if, if a senior wants to move into a market rate apartment complex that's beautiful that was just built they're going to be spending 19 to $2,100 plus mm-hmm. on a studio apartment. Yeah, at least, yeah. Mm-hmm. If you now, in a brand new, um, affordable, quote unquote, senior complex, you're looking at, let's say, 900 to $1,100. Mm-hmm. Right? Correct. Very same exact you know level of amenities, quality. Yep. But that is that makes sense. No, it makes sense, and you know the state has programs where uh, you could, you know, they, they're funding us to provide uh, senior programs in the in, in in that type of housing. So if we're doing a senior property, you know, we, we're going to have some kind of social service provider that mm. that specializes in helping seniors, whether it's helping you know provide meals, whether it's you know even even getting them to work. Some seniors still want to work. Of course. Um, Programs and things like that. I mean, and that's what that's what seniors want, and that's yeah. what they need. In addition, when you're talking about senior housing, there's um, and even if you are pilot or no pilot, yeah. there's um, there's no draw on resources from the schools in the surrounding areas because of who's living there. Right. That's what senior housing is a win-win, especially on Long Island, because you have the need, um, and uh, you have the need, and you have you have uh, you have people that that need this housing. Yeah, and I think. There's a huge demand, right? And we have to be able to understand how do we define what's affordable. Yeah. Because it's a vague term and everybody throws it around. But I think what's generally accepted by everybody is 30% of your income, sure, for your rental expenses is generally affordable. Anything above that is considered rent burden. And that means, yeah, so basically that's, so people understand, so across the board, whatever you make, whether it be $5 or $5 million, you don't want to allocate any more than 30% of that income. Is that pre-tax? Is that gross? That's gross. gross. So before taxes. Yes, so if yes. you're making, let's say, $100,000 a year, you're talking 30000 but that $100,000 a year is really only like 65000 So it's essentially like 50% of your after-tax income, which is a lot. Yeah, yeah, that's correct. And when you talk about a housing market like Long Island, where prices to, for purchase and, and to finance your homes are increasing, but wages haven't really increased for the individuals that are going to be living in these homes, Mm -hmm. then you get into a mathematical crunch where it doesn't make sense, right? So the state and the the local jurisdictions see this. They're feeling the impacts of it. We were talking about a lot of what they call it, the brain drain, where once they graduate from college, they seek opportunities for lower cost housing. So I think from the state's perspective for the financing, um, somebody who has a really great plot on Long Island, they're going to want to maximize their return. Right, they're not gonna immediately go to affordable because yeah. while they can purchase something and sell it at a higher rate, they're gonna get a higher return. Yep. So I think it's the state's role and local 
governments to incentivize affordable housing. So, so that everybody knows, and either one of you jump in on this, mm-hmm. um, that it, let's talk about the uh, the tax credits that help with the construction right. and how that comes in on a state level. So essentially, when you're doing when you're doing affordable housing, let's say on a senior level or in general, even if there's a pilot program involved, you're not really you're not draining the local community. The tax right. breaks that enable the construction to happen at a cost that lets it pe- makes it pencil out is something that comes from from the state. Uh, well, yeah, it's co- it comes from state bonds and it comes from an investor in tax credits. So those investors, they're they're not really they're not individuals. They're they're typically uh, banks. So you know it could be TD Bank, Citibank, Key Bank, any of these banks. Okay. Uh, they invest in the tax credits and they invest in the write offs, basically. Do they have so just so people understand, kind of delve a little bit more into that as far as the banks go? So they do they have um do bank is this banks have a mandate to basically in, invest in their local community? That's correct. Yes. Elaborate on that program as much as you know or um or want to speak about. Yeah, I mean, uh, yeah, I mean, it's it's I guess it, it's it's a law. They have a, they have a credit rating where they have to invest in X amount of affordable housing in X amount of neighborhoods. Mm-hmm. Um, and that's what enables us to to build affordable housing. So they they'll they'll invest. So basically, it's a dollar for dollar tax write off. So in some areas, they might invest say eighty cents uh, and get a dollar dollar back in write offs, or they'll uh, they'll pay dollar ten right or a dollar twenty in some instances as high as that uh, and get a get a dollar write off. So they in addition to getting that dollar for dollar write off, they also get depreciation, which allows them to actually pay a little bit more. So it takes that buck a little bit further in affordable housing. Yeah, so I mean, very very high level, uh, banks are mandated to essentially invest in areas where they have branches or do business. And that's through the CRA, the yeah. Community Reinvestment Act. You want to talk about the Community Reinvestment Act? Sure. Uh, I think it's in Preach. response. It's in response to the recession, um, where banks were you know making loans that were all often defaulted on in certain neighborhoods, and um, think from a high level, the HUD and and the the government saw that there's this. The banks were enabling um, bankruptcies in a way, and they weren't necessarily reinvesting in those neighborhoods to sort of make up for the impact that these, I think, what sometimes can be looked at as predatory lending Mm -hmm. uh, had on these individuals. So through what I think the Obama administration really put into place with the CRA was mandating for any bank that had a physical presence in any community, they also had to invest a certain threshold of money into those communities. And a big way of that is by financing affordable housing, either either through the low-income housing tax credit or by providing um, low cost interest rates uh, loans to subsidize the affordable housing development. So I think you'll see a lot of the major banks that have um, you know gone through because of the uh, recession um, settled with the government like the Department of Justice to, um, to sort of monetize their impact in that whole crisis. Those funds are then uh, utilized to subsidize. I did a project in um, Riverhead that actually used some funding from the CRA and uh, was that one of the ones on Main Street? Yes. With was, the, was that the first one? Like when you were, you know how the, you have Main Street and you have that kind of major road. I forgot what it is that bisects. As you're coming into Riverhead, is it that the first one on the right? It's right by the aquarium um, and McDermott Street. Oh, it's it's close to the aquarium. Yeah, cool, closer to the aquarium. So it's okay. not that one, but. All of this affordable housing is being um, funded through these programs that have been put into place to combat the recession and, and the drain that ad, that on in families and keeping them being able to afford their housing um, because through the crisis there was a crisis of affordability. Yeah, yeah absolutely. And, and I think, you know, people say to me like, oh, well, you know, what's going to cause the next recession? I'm like, my opinion is it's it's a slow grind down. It's... How many straws can you continue to stack on the backs yeah. of a certain group of people yeah. that just can't? I mean, I mean, it's taxes, it's construction costs going up, it's you know inflation. Even though people you know say that inflation's not that bad, I think inflation's a lot worse than people think. Mm-hmm. It's just it's it's childcare now. It's student debt. It's like how much can a thirty-two-year-old making a hundred thousand dollars a year who right. has to pay three hundred dollars a month to get back and forth to Manhattan? Afford before he just says or she says I can't do it anymore. Right, exactly. And no, I mean affordable housing stabilizes communities. 
You know what I mean? And it makes it so that all those straws that keep piling on don't actually, you know, uh, break the camel's back, you know, so to speak. Um, and lastly, one thing that I, I wanted to mention before, but I but I didn't because we went off on a, on a tangent, which is great, is um, the general makeup of your company. The very cool thing is you guys, similar to the, the mix that Long Island has created, have an, have an awesome mix of people, ages, cultures, etc. Like you have, you go into a lot of, um, I always say that, we're in a really great place because there seems to be a, a, a void in everything. Like there's a lot, if you're, if you're 20 to 50, I feel like whatever business you're in is a massive amount of opportunity because mm -hmm. there's a huge void. Like if I look at developers, yeah. I'm sure there's other people that I don't know, but like there's me, there's you, and then right. like everybody else is much, much older. Right, yeah. Right? And, and the way things have been done is a certain way and now things are changing. You have a very young, you know, fresh look, yeah. diverse group of people yeah. that are that are super impressive for any age, but especially the age that, that you guys are. No, I, I appreciate it. I mean, you know, we we don't discriminate based on age, but yeah, we have some uh, we have some young guys <laughs> working for us. Uh, like John, John's incredible. John uh, John actually worked at the state, so he he's really our he's our finance guru. He knows all the state programs. He's extremely valuable to us. Um, but yeah, I mean, and you know, John Laronis, who, yes. you know, helped connect us. Absolutely. Uh, yeah, there's, uh, there's a lot of young, hungry professionals out there looking yeah. to make a name for themselves. Yeah. With fresh ideas. The industry, yeah. I mean, I know you say you don't discriminate, but don't look at him. Look at me. <laughs> Is there anybody in there that doesn't have awesome hair? <laughs> just don't... Just, just, Man, see, you could, you you start at the top when you know John, and John's hair is just phenomenal. There might be a bald discrimination <laughs> at MDG because John has this luscious mane that's like a helmet that just yeah, doesn't move. Right. Yeah, it's yeah, still it's, it's aerodynamic. Nobody knows how he gets it done every morning, but he you have a hair line. High. You have a hairline that hasn't moved ever. No, you, you guys are awesome. Thank you for coming down. I really appreciate it. Amazing information. How do people learn more about you, research you, see the awesome projects that you've done? I know you have renderings around of, of some of the things you have done and are going to be doing, and they're they're absolutely they're beautiful. Yeah. No. Uh, yeah. You can visit us at www uh, www.mdgny.com. You can see some of our projects. You get in contact with us. Um, if you have a site that you'd like to develop. Feel free to contact Handsome Homebuyer uh, or ourselves, and we'll, we'll definitely tackle it together. So happy to do that. If you have a house that smells like cat pee, dated from the 1960s, or a development site that could go anywhere, I want to buy it. 516-777-SOLD. And obviously, if you have a permit problem, plan problem, if you're a realtor, a mortgage broker, have a house, buy a house, want to buy a house, or thinking about ever buying a house, you want to call the captain, the only captain, Captain Permit. 516 516- 513-8838. That's a wrap. Orgulloso estoy de mi herencia judía. Venía mi ley, ven, somos. Cuando me llamas a la torre, así me llamo.